Today we're going to be talking about the Jazz Age. Um, this is a nickname given to the 1920s uh, because jazz is kind of the, the music that signifies the era, but also everything that goes along with jazz, the dancing, the culture, the drinking, and the entertainment that goes along with the era. We're going to begin this part of the lecture with um, post-war literature, and literature is going to play a big part in um, telling the story of the 1920s. The nickname given to those that were the prominent writers of this time were known as the Lost Generation. This was a uh, term that was coined by Gertrude Stein. She, as well as many other authors and musicians and painters and artists of the time, were beginning to question accepted ideas um, of the pre-World War I era, questioned the accepted ideas about reason, progress, religion, society, culture, um, pretty much everything that you can kind of think of, they were beginning to question. And it was because of the war itself. They were starting to imagine um, what the world would have been like without the war and also how the war has changed the way that people view things. Um, they were starting to question things like uh, patriotism and uh, even the idea of democracy because we had fought such a brutal war for democracy, killing millions and millions of people in the, uh, in the fight for democracy. And they were questioning, was that really what was necessary? Most of these people are going to be settling in Paris. Um, that was kind of the, the, the hub for all of these highly artistic individuals. An idea that becomes very prominent among the lost generation is the idea of existentialism. Existentialism is kind of a hard concept for a lot of people to wrap their heads around um, because basically what it is is that there is no universal truth. There is no universal understanding of the meaning of life. Um, everything is personal. Everything has to do with your own individual experiences and your own actions and the choices that you take as well as it is questioning your purpose. It is questioning your truth and it is questioning your meaning of life, which may be different from everybody else's. So I have this great Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon that, that kind of explains the idea. You have Calvin here and he's building a snowman and he says, why does man create? Is it man's purpose on earth to express himself, to bring form to thought and to discover meaning and experience? And he sits there deep in thought. Or is it just something to do when he's bored? That's kind of existential. This, this part right here where he's kind of questioning his purpose in life and why he's doing what he's doing, that's existentialism. And within this idea of existentialism, questioning society, questioning culture and what has always been the status quo or what has always been expected, they began to change a lot of other perspectives of um, their lives in their world. For example, Gertrude Stein, the person who coined the term the lost generation, reworked what a book could be like. Now, traditionally, books have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have characters, they have a storyline with, you know, some kind of problem and a climax to the story and so on and so forth. And she decided that that doesn't be what a book has to be. In fact, she actually had lost faith in words altogether. She said that words had lost their meaning. We fought a war for democracy and killed millions of people in the process. That's not democratic. And so what happens when words lose their meaning? All they are are sounds. And that's what she did. She wrote a book of sounds. This is a short excerpt from her book, Tender Buttons, Objects, Food, Rooms. A carafe that is a blind glass, a kind in glass and a cousin, a spectacle and nothing strange, a single hurt color and an arrangement in a system to pointing. All this and not ordinary, not unordered and not resembling. The difference is spreading. Glazed glitter. Nickel, what is nickel? It is originally rid of a cover. Now you're probably thinking to yourself right now, that makes absolutely no sense. That that's just gibberish. That's ridiculous, and you're just kind of sitting there kind of going, huh? 
Well, that's because you're trying to put meaning into it. But remember, she did this with the intent that it was just sounds, that words were no longer meaningful. They were simply sounds. So I'm going to read just the first part again to you again. And I want you to just listen to it as sounds. A carafe that is a blind glass, a kinding glass and a cousin, a spectacle and nothing strange, a single hurt color and an arrangement in a system to pointing. All this and not ordinary, not unordered and not resembling. The difference is spreading. When you listen to it as simply just sounds, it sounds nice. It sounds like it flows. It sounds like those words should go together. But when you try and attach meaning to it, it is gibberish. Um, and that was her whole point, is that words had lost meaning, and so we needed to get back to giving words new meaning. However, not all authors of this time went quite so existential with their writing. And a great example of that is Ernest Hemingway. His books are very straightforward, and those words are very plain and to the point. Um, he is known for very stoic male characters, um, and also his books have a lot of a disillusionment with youth and heroism. You see this in his books, The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, both of which having to do with um, uh, the war and the effects of war. Now, the reason why this is his writing style is because Ernest Hemingway had served in World War I. He served as an army medic, and he saw some of the worst parts of the war. He didn't necessarily see the glory of battle. All he saw was the death, the injuries, the destruction, and those that were praying for death. And so that very much changed his perspective on war, his perspective on heroism and blind, uh, blind excitement of youth. Hemingway would continue to be a, an incredibly influential author um, for the rest of his life. Um, he was also an expatriate. He moved to Paris for a while. He moved to Spain for a while. He eventually ended up in Cuba and lived out the rest of his days there. Um, but his books are kind of the, um, the opposite example of what World War I was expected to be. That it was not heroic, that it was not this glorious event where young men went into battle to, you know, to show their bravery. But it was dark, it was deadly, and it was a devastating event. But if we're talking about the authors of the time, we have to talk about F. Fitzgerald for two reasons. Number one, he's the one that actually coined the term the Jazz Age. So he's the one responsible for um, giving kind of a title to the excitement and the glamour and the youth and vitality of the era. And you can see this so well in his book, The Great Gatsby. Um, the Great Gatsby has all of the best things, all of those exciting events that we so much, um, you know, we, we all admire, those that are, you know, the wealthy, the glamorous, the, the, the high class. And that's exactly what was shown in The Great Gatsby. And so as people started to read the book, they wanted to then emulate it. And they tried to look like those people that they read about in the book. And they tried to act like them and to live their lives in that same, um, that same manner. However, the life of Gatsby, it is a story. And it is, um, it's one that shows the dangers of living this type of life. And that was something that was often lost on many of his readers, that they focused so much on the excitement of the book that they forgot about the warnings that it had of the negative side of this kind of um, uh, unrestrained lifestyle. Technology has a huge impact as well on how we um, behave during this period of time and how it affects our culture. And none more so than the radio. The radio was the most important invention of the 1920s. It completely changed how we behaved and how we communicated as a society. Um, it created a homogenous American culture more than we had ever had before because everybody is listening to the same thing at the same time. So, for example, if you have a favorite sports team, now you can follow your favorite sports team as they go on the road. 
listen to the game as it actually happens and be able to kind of keep that excitement. Before this, you just had to wait until the next day when the information would then be put into the newspaper and you would read about it secondhand. It loses the enthusiasm and so people become much more attached to their specific local teams. It also changes entertainment. Um, we're all listening to the same programs, programs like uh, Red Rider and, um, and the Marx Brothers were very popular, both um, dramas and, um, and soap operas and uh, action shows and comedies, along with the news were important for drawing the country together. It's kind of like, you know, today when everybody comes back, you know, back together on, on Monday and it's like, you know, oh my gosh, did you watch The Walking Dead on Sunday? You guys all have this common thing that everybody watches, everybody experiences together, even though you experienced it in your own homes. And be able to get the news via radio is also really important because now, News can be spread absolutely instantaneously. If something major happens, everybody can learn about it right away over the, over the airwaves. And so it brings the country together that way as well. Advertising has a huge impact because now everybody is able to hear about the same products. So whether you live in New York or San Francisco or San Antonio, you are going to be able to hear about the exact same products and be able to buy them as well. But one thing that was totally unpredicted was that it would standardize our speech patterns more than we would ever have guessed. Um, prior to this, each part of the United States had very clear, distinct speech patterns and dialects. So please forgive my absolutely horrendous drawing of the United States here, but... Yeah, terrible. Okay, but I'm trying to prove a point here. Um, so let's say that you lived in New York City, okay? You obviously have a very clear accent. And we know that people from the South, like people from Texas and people from Louisiana, they have a clear accent as well. And then, of course, we know that people from the Great Lakes area, they have an accent, don't you know? Um, and so we do see some. Over here in California, we say that we don't have an accent. Other people say we do, but overall, this is kind of all we hear today, and we don't really hear it that much anymore. I mean, if you listen, there are a lot of people that are from the South today that don't have an accent. Same thing with people that are from New York or New Jersey or even from the Midwest. They don't really have an accent, and that's because of things like the radio and television. It teaches us how we should sound. And so, although maybe the people in your specific area will have an accent that's very clear and very distinct, what you're hearing on the radio is a non-accent. Now, why did they do that? Well, imagine that you live here in California. You are not necessarily going to want to listen to a radio program or listen to a, um, uh, a, tele, you know, a radio show that has accents of people that are from like New York. It's a sound that not only you're not used to, but it might be kind of a grating sound on your ear simply because you don't hear it all the time. And so they created this non-accent that allowed for us to be able to um, all kind of hear um, this, this standardized speech. Um, what this is called in many times is called a mid-Atlantic um, mid-Atlantic accent, or sometimes in, sometimes called a transatlantic ac accent. If you've ever noticed in like old-time movies how they speak with that almost British accent, but not quite, that's what it was. It's almost like it's an accent that's from literally midway through the Atlantic Ocean. It's not quite American, but it's not quite British. It's kind of in between. And this was designed specifically to be the standard non-accent for the radio and then later on for movies and television. 
Aside from the radio, the most important piece of technology for uh, Americans was the automobile. And it quickly became a staple of American consumerism. It played a huge role in the economic boom of the time. It created so many jobs. It created so much for, uh, for people to buy. And it was a huge status symbol. Plus, it, able, uh, it enabled urban sprawl. It allowed for us to move further outside of our, our neighborhoods, that we did not have to work and live in the exact same area. I can pretty much guarantee that most of your parents don't live and work in the same city. They probably don't work in Eastvale. They probably work in Orange County or LA or something like that. How are they going to get there? With a car. Um, and that really was spurred in the 1920s. It also created a lot of opportunities for young people to get away from their families. Um, prior to this, if you wanted to go on a date, you A, generally had to have some kind of chaperone with you, and B, there really wasn't much of anywhere to go. And so now that you have an automobile, you can go further distances and hey, if a you know tire pops on the way and you get a flat and you guys have to hang out for a little bit, you know, so be it. Um, now, most people that were buying automobiles bought them on credit. As we discussed in a previous class before, uh, before Thanksgiving, credit was a way that we were buying just about everything at this time. And um, please remember that with credit also comes the interest that you have to pay on that original per, uh, purchase. And so that is going to be a bit of a problem with people buying things that are outside of their um, means. But overall, the people were really excited to be able to have um, to be able to have this kind of technology at their fingertips and made their lives much better overall. And it's all thanks to this guy right here, Henry Ford. Um, by 1920, this was pretty much the way of life for many Americans. And the reason was because Henry Ford made the first affordable autom automobile. Um, the very first person to invent the automobile, and I want to remind you guys, is not Henry Ford. It was actually Carl Benz. Carl Benz was a German inventor, and he developed the first um, locomobile, as they called it originally. Except for it was very painstaking for them to build it because it was built by hand. It was also extremely expensive because it was built by hand, and it really wasn't that good. Um, for the most part, people bought one just to say, hey, look what I've got. Um, it didn't really, wasn't an actually practical thing to own. It didn't get you anywhere any, you know, fast at all. It wasn't until Henry Ford started using the assembly line that suddenly it made more sense that he was able to make this an affordable thing because by using the assembly line, he was able to make it a lot faster. And whenever something's faster, it makes it a whole bunch cheaper. So a great example of this, when he started um, selling his cars, the, the Model T uh, in 1930, uh, 13, excuse me, they were able to make one car every 93 minutes. So about every hour and a half, they were able to produce one car. That means it's still taking a bit of time to make. And so it sold for $490 at the time. Now that equates to roughly about um, $12,000 today. But by 1925, they were able to drop that down to $295 and they were able to produce one car every 10 seconds. $295 in 1925 is roughly about $4,000 today. So $4,000 to get a brand new car. That's not a bad deal. And um, it was because of this system that he was using. Um, the Model T was the, uh, the most popular type of car to get. And uh, uh, one of the things that made it so successful was that um, it was so cheap. Now, Henry Ford was quoted as saying, you can get the Model T in any color you wish, as long as that color is black. And um, that particularly is in reference to the fact that they only sold them in black. Why? Because it was more efficient and thus it made it cheaper. Um, people afterwards realized that, hey, having, you know, 30 black cars that all look exactly alike going down the street may not be the best thing. And so it created a whole new 
group of jobs where people started painting cars and, and having um, accessories that you could add on after the fact. Probably the most exciting technological feat of the time was the first solo transatlantic flight by Charles Lindbergh. Uh, not too long uh, after um, the first airplane was actually flown um, in 1903, um, there was a challenge made. A New York hotel owner made a challenge that asked uh, to have someone try and fly across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Paris. And he was offering $25,000 for someone to be able to do this which is pretty close to about half a million dollars today as a prize for doing this. And this, was, um, this challenge was taken up by Charles Lindbergh. He was able to fly across the ocean um, from New York to Paris, and it took him roughly about 38 hours to do so. That means he was awake for well over a full day and flew by himself. Now, to be able to do this, he had to make some adjustments to his plane. The Spirit of St. Louis had to be altered. Um, first of all, they had to take off as much weight as possible in order for it to get to Paris on one tank of gas. Um, he also was going to need to get rid of any excess equipment that would weigh down the plane. So he basically was flying with virtually no navigational equipment, the heater was taken out in order for him to kind of lighten up the load. And so this would cause for him to be flying at extremely high altitudes with no heat. Um, it must have been incredibly uncomfortable for him to do so. But the moment that he landed in Paris, he was an instantaneous international superstar. He had done what others had died trying to do and he had succeeded. Now, that may not have been exactly what he was hoping for. Charles Lindbergh was extremely quiet and shy, did not like the idea of celebrity, and yet he was almost instantaneously the first international superstar of this era. His flight would inspire many, many others to try their hand at flight, and one of those would be Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart sought to do not only what, um, what females had yet to do, but she tried to outdo the men as well. And her plan was to make a round-the-world plane flight. And so she had gotten 23,000 of the 24,000 miles across the ocean. She was only about 1,000 miles away from her destination. And she disappeared. It was decades before we had any inclination as to what actually happened. They had immediately sent out a search party and couldn't find any trace of her. She had gone missing and disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle, which kind of furthers on that conspiracy theory of, you know, the Bermuda Triangle being this mysterious place where, you know, ships and planes all tend to go missing. We did find out actually just a few years ago pretty much confirming that her plane went down in the middle of the ocean, that um, they had had some kind of trouble and um, she lost control of the plane and they plunged into the ocean. That is most likely what occurred based on our modern evidence of um, scraps of the plane that we have recovered from the bottom of the ocean. And finally, this is not technology, but... Um, it, it kind of is an interesting uh, cultural shift at this time that has to do kind of with art, but kind of architecture, but kind of not. Um, if you look at all of these items, you might notice that they have some things in common. For example, let's look over here at the Empire State Building. You'll notice that it has this repeating pattern here on its roof. And it also has all of these little starburst triangles, which you see a similar thing on this sconce right here, these triangle shapes. And you see the same thing here on this necklace. 
You see a repeating pattern even on this dress and the stripes down here and kind of this geometric pattern here. You see this sun ray effect on this cabinet radio and also a similar thing up here at the top of these elevator doors. And if you notice, especially on, this, on the elevator doors, look at the symmetry here. The left side is exactly like the right. And if you did that to any of these, the left side seems to be a reflection of the right. The left side, the reflection of the right. And so all of these have some things in common. Geometry, geometric shapes, repeating patterns, and also these really serve no purpose, do they? There's no reason why this top part of the Empire State Building has to be done like that. It's done like that because they could and it looks nice. And this is going to be the art style that is most indicative of the 1920s. It's called Art Deco, and Art Deco design is everywhere on buildings that were either built in the 1920s or designed to remind you of the 1920s. This is outside of the Pantages Theater in Los Angeles, and you can see this idea of the geometric pattern, of the repeating patterns, as well as the starburst shapes that we saw on the others, this is indicative of Art Deco design. This was on jewelry, this was on architecture, this was in, um, in patterns of furniture and so on and so forth. And it was, um, Art Deco literally means art decoration, as in, it's just there to look pretty. We had not really done this before the 1920s. Everything was supposed to have a purpose. Everything was supposed to have a meaning. Everything was supposed to be used for something. Now, we're making things look pretty simply because we can. And that is part of the culture and part of the attitude of the 1920s, that we can make things beautiful simply for the sake of being beautiful, that we can enjoy ourselves and that we can um, have these elegant and somewhat extravagant things because times are good, the war is over, and there's seemingly nothing that we have to worry about.